Well, hi there, everybody. Uh, welcome to the first session of AUC this year. Um, I'm Helen, it even says so up there. Um, today's talk is on what I call Beyond Build and Run. And it's a look at using Xcode and the features in Xcode to get more out of your build and run experience. It doesn't say much, so let's get started. So who is this particular talk aimed at? Well, not that fella, um, but certainly beginner level people. Um, but even that is not necessarily a strictly accurate sentence. It's mainly for anybody who has debugging output of their app that looks like that. You can see what I'm doing here. There's a whole heap of logic checks to make sure I've got math happening properly. There's a whole heap of tracing execution through delegate methods and view controller calls. And then right down the bottom here, I've got this bang crash. And if you're trying to work out what's caused that, having to go through all of that is a real pain in the ass because you've got to filter out all your delegate calls and go, okay, it's probably not in there. It's probably not a logic call, but what the hell is it? So that is a really ineffective way of debugging your apps, but a lot of people never actually move beyond that because they don't know what else is available. It's also for people who have an app like this and they're tired of re-entering text every time they want to test a, a different load of input. So if you're validating user input or just want to make sure that, you know, it's not just for forms, of course, but if you've got anything that needs to be displayed and you want to check what a different string will look like. It's also if you've got a localized app and you want to check what your app looks like in all the different languages. Now, auto layout's pretty awesome, but it, it's not the silver bullet for perfecting text in your apps. Now, most people just go into their iPhone or whatever, go into settings, click internationalization, go through the list looking for the language, and they have to do that for every language that they've got localized. And again, that's just a colossal waste of time. Right. Now, what are we going to look at? We're going to have a look at Xcode, but this isn't going to be one of those, this is the editor screen and this is the inspector screen, you know, please. Um, we're also going to have a look at the debugger, but again, this is not a session on debugging. If you want to know the ins and outs of the PO and how to put conditional breakpoints, uh, maybe a different room will help you. We touch on the debugger, but it's not about the debugger. We're also looking at some localization simply because it makes a really good example but I'm not, again, going to give you instructions on how you, you know, put a different language in your app. And we're going to look at logging, but again, it's not about logging. I'm not going to stand here and dictate to you, oh, you should never log this, and you should always log this, or you should log this a particular way, or blah, blah, blah. It's just used as an example to illustrate. So what we're going to do is have a look at all of these features and how they work together. Now, uh, just a, a quick aside, I just want to make it clear that anything I'm sort of talking about here is not dogma. I'm not saying this is the only way that you should do something. Because you know you get people that say, oh, singletons are evil, you should never use singletons. I'm not going to make any statements like that. It's just a case of these are some ideas, these are ways you can use the features available. It's up to you to decide if it's the most appropriate course of action for your particular app. Now, this type of talk lends itself really nicely to live coding. I'm not going to do that <laughs> because it is invariably a complete and utter disaster. Um, so everything you'll see is going to be screenshots. Um, what I've done is I've got a Xcode workspace here of all the apps that I have screenshotted and they're up in a GitHub repository and I've got the link to them at the end. So if you want to have a look, play around with them, check that they do actually compile. Mm. That's another thing. Now, I'd also like to apologise if I seem to be reading this talk a fair bit. Um, my luggage is currently on holiday in the Bermuda Triangle. Um, <laughs> and it's got my copy of the talk with the presenter notes and everything on it. And so all I've got is this little transcript here. So again, yeah, apologies if I'm reading it. Now, I'm assuming, of course, that you've all studied IT at some point or another. Um, so everything in this, is, even though I've said beginner, is still going to be mostly familiar. Um, I touch on some command line stuff. Again, you know, it's just as an example. 
And so very quickly, I've just got a, a very simple C project, um, a main file and a header file that we include. On the command line, this here is how you compile it into a, an executable. And here we execute it and there's its output there. And what I've done this, the reason I've done this is to illustrate the topic, the, the name of this um, talk is called build and run. So we've got the build phase here and we've got the run phase here. And when you do that in Xcode, you've got exactly that. It's just got pretty colours and a GUI on it. So that, that's all it is, is a cover for that. Right. So having said that we're not going to look at Xcode, let's have a look at Xcode. Um, need to just check up on some terminology to make sure we're all sort of talking about the same thing. Xcode has a project, it has the concept of a project. And all that is, is a collection of all the resources that you need to build a particular product. Now, you'll have a list of those resources, whether they be code, they could be images, they could be sound files, absolutely anything. Not every file has to be used in a particular project. In, not every file in a particular project has to be used for an individual target. So you can have files that are just in like your free um, example of your app, you can have other files that are used in the paid version of your app. Now, so what's a target? A target are the instructions for building a particular product. Now, a configuration. It's a collection of build settings. So what are build settings? If you click on, there's a little option in there called build settings. If you click on that, you get sort of this arcane list of environment variables that you can use in your app. A configuration is nothing more than a collection of them. And a given Xcode project can have multiple configurations. And you've even probably seen that if you've toggled between show levels and whatever the other option is that I can't remember right now. And the show levels ones actually shows how it works. And they work like a cascading style sheet in that you have a, a, an order of precedence that they go from the target, from the project to the target, and that in turn is overridden by anything you pass in on the command line. And by default, Xcode creates two of these configurations called, strangely enough, um, debug and release. And you've probably all seen and used them. And the last thing that we're going to sort of deal with is a scheme. I kind of think of it as the matrix of Xcode. Um, it brings together all of those upper three things and combines them in a particular way that you determine to create your output. Okay, so the first thing we're going to have a look at is, is how we control the build phase. That's the, the pre-process compile and link that we saw on the little command line example. Now, we're going to do this by having a look at solutions to a specific problem. Now, I don't want you to get caught up on what the specific problem is, because it's just a fairly lame example that I've used to illustrate a whole heap of different things that we're going to have a look at. So really, don't get caught up on it and start thinking, oh, you could have done this a better way, or blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a case of just, just use it for, for its intended purpose here. Now, I just want to make sure that everybody's familiar. I mean, I know you all are. But with all the different macros that we can use, um, the hash and port statement, of course, you've definitely used. Um, we also get some system provided constants. Um, and those import statements up there, you'll probably never actually have to manually do it. The reason I've included them is because there's some really nifty header files to go poking through if you want to see the type of things that Xcode make available for you. It's, yeah, th there's 100 billion of them. Um, some of them make absolutely no sense. Um, some of them you sort of go, hey, that's really neat. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you've got the macros. And I just wanted to make sure, too, that everybody is familiar with the two sort of hash defines you can have. Um, the first one is effectively a Boolean. It's either defined or it's not. The second one is where you actually give it a particular value. In the first one, you just do it in if def, if defined, and that just is yes or no. But the second one, you can actually check for the value. And we're going to be doing that a bit in later examples. OK. Now, you can also do passing those hash defines on the command line as well. You don't have to just include them in code. 
Now, if you want to include a hash define that is seen by every source file in your project, you need to do it in somewhere like the pre-compiled header file. If you just do it in a single source file, it's scoped just to that file. So if you do, you know, hash define foo equals three and expect that to work in another file, it won't. You'll have to stick it in the pre-compiled header for it to be seen absolutely everywhere. Okay, now that's all the um, background stuff out of the way. Um, so we'll actually look at controlling the build phase and just a bit of a thought to mull over. What if the ultimate build phase control was to not perform a build at all? And that, answering that question is what I want to have a look at. Now, it's actually come from a real world example because I was working on a project not so long ago where it was decided that the best way to do some configuration of it was to have a JSON file. And every time the app launched, that JSON file would be read and colours would be set and fields would be pre-populated and all that sort of business. And as the project got bigger, more people started working on it, the JSON file started getting out of control. And more often than not, when the app started up, it would just explode in a um, cacophony of, you know, faults and errors and could not build because the JSON format was invalid. So what we wanted to do was run some sort of lint program over the JSON and if the lint said no, not valid, then we just wanted to stop the build process altogether. Um, and so that's what the rest of this talk is, well, not the rest of it, a part of this talk is based on is how we actually went about doing that because it's a very nice way of sort of indicating some of the different features and things that are available. Okay, the easiest way to abort a build is to make use of the hash error preprocessor directive. All it does is just causes the build to fail and if you provide an argument to it, something like hash error, I was told not to go any further, it'll just print that out in your logging business with the little red exclamation mark beside it. Now the trick was how to get our hash error to only conditionally take effect. I mean, if you just go hash error, it's going to do it every time. It is really not much use in doing that. And so we had to pass, we, we, we used some sort of variable so that we could do, you know, if abort build is true, then hash error. But of course, you then somehow have to get the output of your lint script into an environment variable that the Xcode build system would take notice of. That was fun. Conceptually, this is what we wanted to do. We just wanted to export, you know, abort build true and have the build system define abort build to the value of our abort build variable. Can you do that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Took us quite a while to figure that out, but, you know, it's just not possible to do something like that because Xcode does not look at your environment. So, solution. The first thing we did is if you have a look in the scheme, um, there's a the, the build, you can see that we created a pre-build action. And we just created a script file. And what it ostensibly does is you can pretend that that second block of comments there, I'm saying just pretend in here we're running our JSON link thing. And we get the return value of that, you know, either um, dollar question mark or whatever you want to do. And what we did is echoed that line in red to an external header file. So when you build and run, it runs this script before it actually starts any of its other business. Um, and that's what it does once it's run. It just puts that into the header file, and then in our main.m, what we did is have a look, we get it to import our settings file, and that's where our conditional comes from. Works quite nicely. Um, there are a couple of people that weren't terribly happy with, oh, you're creating this arbitrary file, and what's it not setting, and oh my goodness, it was all just a bit much, and... You, you know, th these people get caught up on their, their little, you know, coding guides where you can and can't do this, that and the other. So it works. It works a treat. It works reliably. Um, 
but due to what I call the grumpy old farts, um, some of them weren't too happy with this particular solution and they wanted to have a look at a better way because, you know, importing a file like that is usually a header file, but it's not clear that that's not a header file, even though it's got a dot settings extension. Um, yeah, some, some grumpy people. So we came up with an alternative. Um, any Perl programmers will be familiar with this. There is more than one way to do it. Again, I'm not saying this is the better one. It's just a different one. Um, okay. So if we go into our back into Xcode, what we're going to do this time is add a run script build. Is add a run script to the build phase, and it pops up a new entry in our build phases that allows you to dump a script in. Now, if you're, if you're a bit sort of quick on the uptake, you'll see this is exactly the same script as the one in the previous example. And it edits exactly the same file. But because it was done in a different way, some people were happy. Go figure. I don't know. But again, it, it makes a nice, you know, in the real world, it's, you know, face palm. But for the purpose of this talk, it's also a nice example. You've, you've achieved the same effect two different ways. Um, that does, of course, beg the question that why would you use one after the one as opposed to the other? And that comes down to the scope in which you want this script to execute. When you do it in the um, pre-build phase, that's based on a particular configuration, a particular action. In, do it in here. You can base it in a project, you can base it in a target, and you can do that whole matrix thing where you can sort of come together saying, okay, in that condition we won't execute it, in this condition we will execute it, that sort of stuff. Again, it comes down to, and this is why it's pointless trying to dictate you should always do it this way, because you can't. It depends on the particular example that you're building for. Now, the other nice thing that you get for free when you use this particular phase is that if you echo anything or print anything, it actually appears in the build log. If you do anything to stand it out in a, in a pre-build script, it just goes to dev null. Or if it goes somewhere, I've never been able to find it. So you, you have to do all sorts of redirection, like echo got here, 2, 2, output.txt, or you know, so, something bizarre like that. The other nice bit you get from this particular way is if you tick show environment variables, again, in your build log, you get a list of all the environment variables that your build process is using. So again, if the script's not working as expected, you can sort of have a look and go, oh, well, of course, I've got the wrong whatever. Um, in, the, in the other one, you'd, you'd have to go in and you know, redirect. You have to go print env. I think I've commented that out at the top, yeah. In the top one, you'd have to go print end pipe sort to some sort of output before you get anything meaningful debugging. Okay, now at the bottom of that script, you've got these two options here for input files and output files. What they do is potentially quite counterintuitive. If you're thinking that anything that appears in the input is going to get passed to it and anything that appears in the output is going to redirect to, <laughs> sorry, that's really wrong. <laughs> you couldn't be further from the truth. All that is is a mechanism for conditionally running that script. So if you provided an input file and an output file, it doesn't matter what they are, and it could have absolutely nothing to do with the script whatsoever, it will simply look at the timestamps on both of those, uh, on the files in the two of them, and say, if my input script is newer than my output script, my, if my input file is newer than my output file, I will run that script. If they're not, it won't run the script. It's effectively doing what make does when it has a look to see if it wants to recompile something or not. It's, it's, it, it's an odd way of doing it. And if you only have an input or only have an output, it will always run that script. So for it to do anything, you have to populate both fields. Yeah, yeah. Okay.
Now, what we've got here is the not so good solution to the problem. <laughs> Again, it's included because it's a nice way of introducing a couple of features. Um, it's more of a case of abusing the features, though, than using them. So what we do is we add a user-defined setting. And this is how we can add stuff to that whole list of build settings business that at the moment, you know, control your um, provisioning profiles that want to use and you can put C flags in them and, you know, that, that, that whole big long thing. Upon doing that, it will scroll you, it's nice of Xcode to do this, it scrolls you all the way to the bottom and you can see, you can give it a name and you can optionally give it a value. Now behind the scenes, Xcode has actually modified one of its own little private personal files. It's the project.pbxproj um, and all I've done there is I've just grepped for the name of the variable I just created and you can see that it's listed it there. Um, the two entries are because there's a, a, a release and a debug version of it. And of course, if you further add configurations, you'll have more. I'll get to that middle line in a sec. Now what we need to do is set up our pre-build script so that a said action takes place on the project.pbx file. And that way, we can change the value of our user-defined variable. Now, the really nice thing here is that we have finally removed that, you know, dot settings file that I created in a previous solution. So that, that kept a couple of, the, couple of the pointy head people happy because there were no more counterintuitive include files being used. However, you know, I'm quite sure that most of you are aware of the time bomb that could go off here. A bad said, if you're not careful enough that you only get those abort build lines, will of course blow up the entire project. Xcode won't even be able to load it from disk anymore <laughs> because it's no longer a valid project file. So, yeah. But some people prefer that and they reckon, oh, well, if you know how to craft your SEDs properly, then it won't be an issue. But again, I forgot when, when I was testing this originally, I know about it blowing up the project because it happened to me more times than I cared to admit. Um, of course, it also keeps a shock copy of your shell script. So if you've used a similar syntax in there for setting things, it's going to blow up your script as well. So th this is why I'm saying abuse this option with caution. Now, the, the rest of this is pretty much exactly the same as what I've described before, um, so I'm not going to go over it again. Basically, we're just getting it to read the value of that um, and do our check, and it, the build will fail or not, depending on if a bought build is zero or anything other than zero. Okay. Um, one more potential solution. Um, again... This one's even worse, but for reasons that will become apparent when I get to the end. It does, however, again, provide an opportunity to examine something else that we can do. Um, an XC config file, what they are is simply a collection of all your build settings. They're, it's just a plain text file. How do you create them? You go into, you know, file, new file. It'll give you the option for configuration setting. You click on that, oddly enough, and you've got a XC config file created. Now, there's nothing special about that file at all. It is just plain text. It doesn't get compiled to anything binary like, you know, plist files or anything like that. So you're free to edit it at will. If you want, there's nothing stopping you from just dropping into the command line going touch da 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 dot XC config. Um, the catch with there is make sure you add it to the project. If you don't add it to the project, Xcode can't see it, so you will never get the option to actually use it. Um, so this is how we tell Xcode to actually use it. If you click on project and then info, you'll see this configuration section. Um, debug and release added by Xcode automatically. Um, now you'll see that none of them have a configuration file set. Uh, that just means Xcode uses all its default internal settings. Um, I'll get to adding a file to those shortly. 
Now what we can do is I clicked on the plus and added my own config file. Um, it gives you the option you can name it. And then that still actually doesn't give you a configuration file when you do that. This is a multi-step process. You actually have to expand the triangle, click a target, and it's only at the target level that you can actually add your XC config file. So I, I was scratching my head about that one for a little while too. I thought, I've just added the damn thing. Why <laughs> you So yeah, expand and add like that. Um, why have I added a hamster? Okay, it is of course perfectly logical. You could just take one of the debug ones um, and modify that, but because I'm very good at blowing things up, I like having a known working good to go back to. So where I can, I will add something of my own, and if I nuke it, then it's not a problem. I just delete it, go back and start afresh. Okie dokie. Now, to actually populate one of these files, it's quite an easy thing to do. If, when you know what you're doing, and you will after the first time you do this, because it really is so simple, you can just start typing things in. But at the very beginning, you're not really aware of what's available, what's the syntax, what does it look like. So the best thing to do is grab one of the existing ones, which is kind of hidden, um, and just copy it into your own and edit it. Now, why did I say it's kind of hidden? Well, if you remember, I think it's the previous one, I said the debug and the release have no config file. It's all internal. You can, however, access it. All you do is go into build settings, you have to select one of these individual lines and then just do Apple A, Apple C and Apple V. Command copy and paste it and that's exactly what it looks like. And those are all your build settings. Now you can see it's broken it out into config and release. That's another one of those things where Xcode tries to lead you up the garden path. Because if you include that, they're not actually processing directives. It won't read through that and try and find the correct scope. It will simply read every single option and it's the last man standing that gets used. This output is just, just, make up a reason yourself. It's just the way Xcode does stuff. Okay, now the trick to realise with this is you only want to include in here what is different. Because Xcode comes with its own set of defaults, its own set of, you know, this, this is what I'll do when I'm not told otherwise, all you need to do is tell it what to do otherwise. So I've tidied mine up and all I want is that abort build equals 42. And I'll just reiterate because this bit me a couple of times, you cannot use this to say configuration equals default um, debug, configuration equals release, configuration equals hamster. It doesn't do that. It completely ignores any of those things. If you want to set that three times for each one, then of course one of the options is to set an XC config file for each of your debug, release, hamster, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't have to. It's one of those things where there's no one path to follow. There's no one specific route to take. Okay, and now that we, when we go back into um, the build settings, you can see that it's picked it up and put it there. And what I'm doing is I'm, the, the reason that says dash D is I'm also just passing it in as a, as a compile option. Okay, now one of the nice things, again, if you just go back a couple, yeah, either that one or that one, you can see that Blah. What the hell does all that mean? You look at that, you sort of go, yeah, excellent, okay. What you can do is this is um, in, I can't remember which menu it is now, I didn't even write that down. Oh, it's the view menu. Um, no, it's not, it's the edit menu, I did write it down. You can switch between show setting names and show setting titles. And when you do that, your build settings will swap between showing the human readable names and the typical environment variable syntax names. So, because uh, I've had that before, I know what I've wanted to set and mostly Xcode's human readable names will sort of resemble, at least, the environment variables, but not always. <laughs> so this is a really good way of, if you're trying to find something specific, just switch to the other type of setting. 
and you're done. Okie dokie. Schemes. Yay! Now, schemes are really, really, really useful. Um, they allow you, as I said before, the matrix, you can marry up configuration settings, targets, um, or all sorts of, you know, just line them up. You have enormous control over what builds and when. Um, what I'm trying to do here is use my hamster configuration file to determine how, you know, a particular action is performed. Now, again, I could just modify one of the existing schemes, but again, I don't like doing that because I'm good at nuking stuff. I, I learn by blowing things up and then learning them how to put them back together again. So if I just use my duplicate scheme, it creates a new one. You can give it a name and tell it what configuration to use, etc., etc., like that. Now, I kind of we've kind of not paid too much attention on what I'm actually doing in this particular solution. But if you recap, we're trying to do this whole conditional build business where if it looks at a variable and it says don't build, then it won't. Um, the trick is, having gone through all of this, if we then try and do a build and run, no matter what my abort variable is set to, it is actually going to run. <laughs> and the reason for that is that you cannot alter the build environment once it is set. And the very act of doing Apple R or Apple B sets the build environment. It will never, ever read any of your XC config files again. Even the pre-build script runs after it set all these environment variables. So a couple of screens ago when I was going through and you know, setting my abort build equals number into my XC config file has no effect <laughs> because that value is already set by the time we've changed it. The changes will be there on the next run, which is also another gotcha because what you'll do is you'll hit build and run and you'll go, oh, hang on a minute, um, I thought it was supposed to do something else. Uh, you hit build and run again because the second time it works. And you've sort, of, you've sort of thought, oh, I, I must have done something else silly or whatever. But that's the reason. Cannot alter it. So what I'm a little bit worried about here, although not too worried, is that I've set um, sort of these XC config files in a bad light because I've used them to demonstrate something that doesn't work. <laughs> okay? <laughs> but the point is, don't worry about this particular example. Just have a look at them and the fact that you can use them. They're available to you. Um, the other thing that they're very, very useful for is when you're working in a group where you do multiple projects um, and you always have particular settings that you want to set. Instead of for each new project having to manually go through, change your build settings, and then one developer forgets to change one or puts the wrong value in and wonders why weird shit happens, create your XC config file, distribute it via Git, SVN, whatever, and then it's always in your projects. Okay, run, yay, we've done building. Okay, so we've customised the build phase. How about customising our run phase? Now, the oldest and most traditional way has been argv and argc. They exist in Xcode, they exist in Objective-C, they're there. They even get passed into our UI application. So they're there in the full um, sort of cocoa every you know, the whole Objective-C business. It's not just a C construct. Um, but before we can access them, what I want to do is just have a quick look at how to set them. And we're back to schemes. And I really like schemes because they're super powerful and they're super configurable. And there's an option in the run that you can pass in command line arguments. And that's all there is to it. You just keep adding pluses, you just keep adding options. Now, the trick with these in, if you have come from a scripting language like Perl or something like that, you have all these beautiful libraries that do things like get ops long and get ops blah, 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 that allow you to do, you know, dash, dash this and process options that require no arguments, options where arguments are optional, 
all of that sort of business. That does not work here. What you see is what you get. That's exactly what it passes in. If you want to do processing, you will have to write that code yourself. There's, there's no niceties about them. Okay, how do we access them? Now, it's just one line of code, although to be contrary, I've actually given you two. <laughs> um, you will, of course, realise you can compress those down into one, but it makes for a really ugly line on the screen. Um, that's all it is to it. NS process info, you create an instance of it. And then there's a method called arguments. Now, having a look at NS process info is good value anyway. There's some super, super interesting stuff in there. There's also another method called environment. And that gives you all the environment variables that it's running under. Now, I don't mean the build environment variables. Um, these are the running environment variables. Completely different kettle of fish. Now, when we actually run that particular bit of code, this is what it spits out. Um, and you can see this is one of the gotchas that even though we passed in dash v2, um, and it looks like we only passed in three arguments, which will give us an argc of four, we've actually got five because it separates those last two out. It takes the space as a delimiter. Now, the first line is one of those super useful things I wish I'd known about years ago. Because as you all know, when you're trying to actually find the sandbox your app is running in, you have to go through there, click through each individual one. Of course, you could use Spotlight or whatever, but you, know, you click through all of them looking for your damn .app file. Arg zero. <laughs> I, I often, when I'm debugging, um, I have a little line that on one of the view controllers, I just have a label that prints out my arg, arg zero, just so I've got it there. Um, yeah, and if you do a label, you can even click it and paste it. So just one of those silly little tips that I wish I'd known about years ago. But I love that if nothing more than arg zero. So there it is there. Now, why do we sort of use args? Why can't you do it some sort of other way? Well, they work very nicely in conjunction with your schemes. So you can only do it with some schemes. And one of the neat things is, is you create a whole heap of different schemes and you can set... I have that little V for dash V being verbose for my debugging output. And I, I will have schemes that have, you know, uh, level one, level two, level three. And depending on what I want to log, what, how many of the logs I want to see, I will just choose that particular scheme and it'll, you know, blurt out whatever I want or don't want at the time. Okay. And that's, yeah, it's the args one that we're interested in here. I call that just level one. That will give me um, the most logging. Then level two is a little bit more. Um, if you want to get really tricky, you can also do some um, oring so that you can either do level three and above, level two and above. At the moment, it's just a only level two, only level three. But if you're not lazy like me, you can, you can do some oring so that you, you get a whole bunch more. Okay. Args are also... the other, One of the other reasons you can sort of really like args is they help testing localised apps. And I absolutely adore this, which is why I've given it sparkly... <laughs> <laughs> given it a sparkly display. If you pass that in as one of your command line args, that's how you can switch between languages in your app without having to go into internationalization settings every friggin' time. <laughs> so again, that is just such a time saver. Um, pass it in again, schemes. You create a scheme for each language that you have and when you want to test it, you just pick the one you like. You only have to, of course, set that once. Okay. And that's just a silly little app. That's what it looks like. You've got your localised strings. And all I did that was change the scheme. No <laughs> fiddling through the phone settings or absolutely anything like that. Okay, the last thing to show is app data. And this is the other method of affecting how your app works at runtime. Um, you can pre-install data into your app and have it use that every time. And that's really good for testing anything that gets saved locally and then you have to process when your app loads. Um, the obvious thing that comes to mind is sort of settings. Um, you you want to validate user input or you want to make sure that when it pulls it up, it parses it correctly. So how do you go about testing that? Now, if anybody here yells out, unit testing, you're absolutely correct. 
for something like input validation, you use unit tests because you can so easily just set up all your edge cases, run through them one at a time, boom, 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 and you're done. But if you want to test anything whatsoever that integrates with the UE of your application, then unit tests won't cut that. So you, you have to find some other way of doing it. Of course, the first way is you just run your app each time and manually type in everything you want to change. Bugger that. <laughs> If you have a look at the scheme, um, there's an option there called application data. And this is what we want to tell it about. But before we can use it, we actually have to create the data to use. Now, in order to do that, you have to run your app on a real device. It will not work on the simulator. Don't even bother trying it. So once you've run it on your phone or something like that, if you pull, in the organ if you pull up the organizer from Xcode, um, you click on the the device name, then you go into applications, gives you a list of applications, click on it, and it also does a very nice thing. Here it actually shows you all the files that are in your devices in your app sandbox. Clicking download just pulls that down and puts it into a single file. Now, of course, it's not a single file. It's got an extension on it, which means it's a package, but it looks like a single file. Okay. Now, what I've done is I've pulled down the, it, it saves it as that .xc app data business. It's just a package going to find a show contents and then edit it to your heart's content. Duplicate it, edit it, put all your edge cases in, put all your, you know, what you're not sure it's going to do when it encounters this, you know, break it basically because it doesn't affect anything else. It, it, if you deliberately break it, it won't actually blow up anything because you just um, get rid of it or you change it or you fix it. And so here I've created two. Um, all they do is on this very silly form is they populate one of them with just letters, the other one with numbers. Um, again, the better way of testing this would be um, to use unit tests, but it's people, it's just an example. Um, Okay, I mentioned at the start about taming your logging. Um, there are some strategies for this. Um, a lot of people have a lot of different opinions, so all I want to do is just say, these are some options, these are a few things that work. If you don't like them, don't use them. If you've got something you prefer, use that instead, excellent. Um, there are some macros that you can use that make your output a bit more meaningful. Um, and those are the ones underscore, underscore, func, line, and file. I, hopefully, they're mostly self-explanatory. Um, function is the function name, line is the line number, file is the name of the actual source file it's looking at. Um, pretty function seems to only work in C++. Um, in the output here, it gives you exactly the same output as func. I had a quick poke around as to what the difference was, and it turns out pretty func, I think, is only a C++ thing. Okay. The next thing that's really helpful are logging breakpoints. And they're very good for getting code flow out of your log statement. So in the beginning example, when I was looking at um, working through delegate methods to work out you know, what order they get called in or looking at view controllers, whether it's instantiating that one before the seg, blah, 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 blah. Logging breakpoints. And that way you can switch them on and off all at once. The first one here, um, the action is a debugger command, and that in here is where you can use your usual P for print, PO for print object. Um, if you've ever done anything like that before, it works exactly the same way. The key is automatically continue after evaluating, and that way your execution won't actually stop. But when you have a look at the debugger down the bottom, you'll get a nice list of things there. One Little trick with um, using logging breakpoints is there can be some funky issues with the buffering of the output. If you have an NS log and a logging breakpoint around the same time, there's no guaranteed order in which they'll be spit out. So you can even find a breakpoint log in the middle of your NS log output because it's buffered a certain amount, then print that, it's received an interrupt, and then it'll print out the rest of it. So Again, there's a caveat with just about everything. It's useful in a lot of situations. It can sort of leave you scratching your head in others. The other alternative 
is the action is a log message. The syntax for this is really strange. Um, the dot B and the dot H are very easy to use, but actually getting an expression that doesn't syntax error at you can be quite tricky. Um, Stack Overflow is your friend for that one. Um, and what then a lot of people do is they will use a debugger command with the log message output. So what you'll do is you'll use log message and print something simple like, you know, this is my break point. Um, I want to see what it's doing here. And then you add, there's the plus button, a second action. Whoops. And your second action will be the debugger command because then you can just use PO, which is nice and user-friendly. <laughs> so, yeah, I sort of screenshotted that actually, but I didn't. Okie dokie. Now, another thing a lot of people say is they want to switch off logging for the for their release builds. They do not want anything chucked to stand it out on their release builds because it, you know, clogs up your iPhone and that sort of stuff. So there are a couple of methods for making sure that there are no NS logs. My favourite one is poisoning, simply because it sounds so dramatic. <laughs> if you add a directive up the top, now again, this really wants to go in the pre-compiled header file. I've stuck it here just so you can get it all on one screen. Pragma GCC poison NS log. And if it encounters an NS log anywhere in your code, you get this, attempt to use a poison function. So that, that, that blows up properly. It blows up right in your face. It refuses to build or it refuses to do anything. It's a, it's a good way. And you probably want to wrap that in something like, you know, if um, debug equals uh, false, because, you know, the debugging gets passed in the build settings anyway, then you want to keep, you, you don't want to include that. It's only when you're doing the release build that you want to call that. The next thing you can do, and this is what I was talking about before when I said you pass in, you create schemes with different logging levels and how you can do that in code. Um, this is one way. Um, I've just defined log level up there. Normally you'd read it in from your build settings or something. Um, and in the code, you will have a normal NS log that gets logged all the time. And then for level two, you call it NS log two. For level one, NS log one, et cetera, et cetera. And then you've just got a whole bunch of if defs up the top telling it what to include and what not to include. And this is where you can get funky doing the ors so that you get two and above, three and above, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a nice way to play around with it. In case you're not aware, the uh, triple dots in brackets are because they're variable length argument lists. Um, without that, it'll blow up in your face again. <laughs> yeah, so that's one particular method. Um, oh, that's my last trick. Okay. There's one other thing I haven't got a screenshot of. Another method, a less drastic method than poisoning, of switching off your logs altogether, is just go hash define ns log. And it just doesn't build it because it's you've effectively set it to void. So that, that's that's a less yeah. I, I like poison because it's got the flare, <laughs> but the hash define NS log is one that you'll actually see crop up a fair bit. Now this is sort of my last little trick that I just like showing because it's a funky one. Um, you have the build value, you have the version and the build number of your code. A lot of people want to know how they can automatically increment their build number with each build. There it is. This is just a, um, a pre-build script. Uh, again, th th this is a religious war you will see, whether you want to increment your build number after you've built it or before. I really don't care, as long as it changes with each run. Um, and to do that, you either drag it above or below the rest of your build settings. That's how you affect the order of it. Um, the caveat with this is Xcode by default, and this is only with Xcode 5 because that was working fine in 4, but with Xcode 5 it gives you a default build number of 1.0. This relies on the value being an integer. So before you run it the first time you just have to change that to 1 or you can improve that code so it deals with floating points as well. Yeah, it's whatever one you forget to do. <laughs> so, yeah, 
that, that's, that's kind of my last vanity screenshot. It really has nothing to do with the talk, but it's one of those things. It's very, very useful. Not all that many people have discovered it, so there it is. Now, that's it. Um, if you want, okay, if you want to have a look at any of those projects, they are up on GitHub. That's the URL. Um, so you can see that these, they actually do build and run these. <laughs> um, I think we must be out of time here with the rest of it. Um, what I normally do now is, because this is all screenshots, if anybody wants to see some live coding, give me a chance to really embarrass myself. Um, <laughs> You know, if you, if you want to actually see, I, I often get a lot of questions on how do you localize an app, but not here, so it seems. And that's what, that's when I'll do a live code. But yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>